Welcome racing fans to the Wizards Thoroughbred Racing Channel and our show Get Tied On, sponsored by WizardRaceAndSports.com. Welcome here to the back, backyard set at uh, Union Avenue here in Saratoga Springs. Michael and I are here to uh, recap last week's uh, races and uh, we've got a terrific interview for you a little later on in the show. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about handicapping. Michael had an interesting experience this week, and uh, he's looking forward to sharing that with you. Right, Michael? Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and uh, uh, la la lastly, and later on in the show, we're going to add kind of a tail end to our commentary segment, sort of a CBS 60 Minutes review of a prior story. So we hope you'll enjoy that very much. Anyhow, Michael... Uh, we got nine days into the meet. We're exhausted already. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a grind. When you, thank God there's no six days of racing or they'd be carrying me out as a carcass here. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, uh, it, what's it take you to, to get uh, a card covered? You know, well, I mean, start I, to finish. I start my day at 6 o'clock at the Price right. Chopper. So I have my choice of breakfast delicacies. You know? Get to the card. Uh, okay. Get to the card. I take from 6 to about 9 I work on the card. Yeah. Then I have to take some sort of breather, whether it's to swim at the Y or take a walk. Yeah. Uh, then I come back about 10.30. I start preparing for the scratches yeah. and the updates to my sheet. I uh, continue to work till about 12. Yeah. Head to the track. Right, then it's a new job. Then it's, right, <laughs> then I have another eight hours. <laughs> so I, I work at least, uh, I'd say, 12 13 hours a day and and you know the grind too yeah, I know the where grind. you you really have to get your rest and focus because yep. it, it's a it's a long meet but we're lucky because we get to tell our wives we have to go to work and we go to the track okay and away we go uh, <clears throat> let's talk briefly <clears throat> excuse me uh, favorites 45% winning favorites. Are you serious? 45% winning favorites. I, 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 I favorites. would have never predicted that. 45. If you bet every favorite <laughs> in every race since the beginning of the meet, you'd be winning half your races. Well, 45% winning favorites. Well, Absolutely. It's doing better than sure. my picking. <laughs> I mean, because I don't pick favorites every race. Okay, track. Tra let's talk about track bias and uh, uh, the turf course, the main course, and... Uh, I mean, the shoot continues to be a bit of a controversy, but an off the pace horse won the other day. Yeah, I mean, both on the dirt and both grass courses, I really don't see any pronounced bias since the meet started, you know, so I, I really don't. It's been an honest track. Yeah, I think it's, I, I would agree with that. You know, some days it looks a little bit more tilted to the outside pads on the main, but horses still can uh, finish up the rail well. Uh, and it looks like uh, speed, speed and tactical speed, which is the name of the game on dirt, is what it is. Uh, so we'll see how it goes forward. Uh, shippers, just a, a, a minor mention here. We've had 92 races. Uh, 34 of the 92 races have been won by horses who were raced last at Belmont Park. That's 37 percent. You know, when we opened the show a couple weeks ago, uh, we were questioning how well Belmont form would hold up. And I really wonder how much the... The, the lunacy of the uh, Kentucky circuit, what with Churchill Downs, uh, the con controversy there, and moved to Ellis. Really, only two Churchill Downs horses have won, and more have won who had raced at Ellis. Yeah, and, you know, the one thing we mentioned uh, in our first show was that I had said that the Mammoth Rail was right. dead. And uh, the horse, it was like the Belmont Balcony move. <laughs> And it continues to play, especially when it rains and it dries out. <clears throat> They're trying to fix the rail, but the rail has not been great. And we saw that in Haskell Day where <clears throat> the rail was a little better, but uh, when it, it rained a little bit, it dried out. In the middle of the card, uh, the rail started getting a little deeper. And we've seen two horses come off that rail this meet. Uh, one was St. Selby on Saturday. Right that paid 23.20 that got cooked on a fast pace on that dead rail uh, trained by Rob Atris 
Uh, and then there was a horse uh, in the middle of the week that was on the rail and came back. That one I picked, that paid $9. I kind of thought there was a little too much speed on St. Selby because he broke from the outside and there was speed into the inside. But that's two yep. that have come in off that dead rail. Well, we've had a total of five Mammoth shippers win, three last week. And uh, you had mentioned earlier that you thought Rob Atris uh, would, would win a race or two up here. Yeah, uh, he was really cold at Belmont. I think a lot had to do with the condition book that horses didn't fit for him. I spoke to him yesterday, by the way, and he agreed with that. He didn't think he was going to have a great Belmont meet as it progressed, but he's starting to wake up. Mm -hmm. uh, let's move on to hot, cold trainers. Uh, Linda Rice is atop the board with uh, 10 from 31, and quietly, Chad Brown has nine, Todd Pletcher has eight. So all the noise is Linda Rice, Linda Rice, Linda Rice. These guys are just lurking. Well, I, <laughs> I, I definitely have, and I mentioned this in, in the first show, it's going to be a three-horse race amongst the trainers. And I'm predicting Linda Rice has a hell of a chance to win this meet. And, you know, I think about it, like, you know, what she did differently this year. And it's so obvious that Linda went out of town to the Kentucky circuit and claimed a lot of horses that she could ship up to New York, some for herself, for some for some other owners. And she could play the claiming game with those horses, whether it's boosting them in class, keeping, keeping them freshened for 30 days or more and kept at the same level claimed yeah. at, uh, or dropping, right, when the horse was out of jail. And she came with that plan and now she's executed that plan to perfection. The problem she's gonna have is not this meet. She will have a tough time at Belmont uh, when they switch over. I don't think she's Act worried about that. At this, no, at she's this not, but what happens is a lot of those horses are gonna get claimed away from her. It's a lot harder at Saratoga to restock right. because there's multiple shakes for horses. 24, <laughs> the other yeah, day. <laughs> and, you know, so she's gonna lose horses, but and she's not going to be able to claim as many. I don't know what she has left uh, in the bank from the horses that she claimed it in Kentucky. But she prepped for this meet big time. Do you think that she actually went up to Lake George and had a conversation with Gaspar Mashara? Yes, I, I, I do. In the van that Gas, were, they had, they met in the van that we used to sit in. When Gasper took the van out of the track, and that's where the beatings that's are. That's right. There, there was never a better guy at the claiming game than right. Gas, than the Gas Man. Well, you know, Linda Rice is sharp, and she figured out her way of being able to compete with Chad Brown and Pletcher, who, by the way, are going to win races, and <laughs> they're going to win a lot of races. So Linda's trying to build up that five length lead yeah. and try to see if she can hold that lead into the eighth pole until they start coming. <laughs> okay, last in this segment, uh, Michael, let's talk about uh, the injury to Jose Ortiz. Uh, he lost 21 mounts and five of those mounts were winners. You, when I, at the beginning of the meet, I thought that it was gonna be a, clearly a battle between the two brothers. And now Irad wins five races on Saturday. Every day he wins races. He's had 21 wins at the meet, and he's won at 30%. He's distanced himself from his nearest rival. I am just hoping that Jose comes back this mm -hmm. week. He had bruised ribs from what I understand, but uh, this is a very talented rider. I actually prefer Jose as a rider over Irad. Um, he still has a chance if he comes back. But uh, Irad is just distancing himself from every other rider here. At this point, absolutely. Um, well, that'll bring us to the end of this segment, sponsored by Wizard Race and Sports. We'll be right back. Visit wizardraceandsports.com and purchase now. Since 1986, the Wizard has been your source for the best handicapping products for the always challenging Saratoga meet. Wizard selections include analysis and wagering strategies for every race. Wagers are updated after late scratches. The Wizard wagers every day, backing up his opinions with his own money. Visit wizardracingsports.com and purchase now.
Back, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the quarter pole, and it's time for our wagering segment. And you know, uh, I think it's Ed DeRosa who uh, writes for Horse Race Nation, or maybe Joe Christofek, who occasionally says that these are good handicaps. Who occasionally say, you know, you can't sweep the card until you take the first race. Well, on Thursday of last week, Michael took the first race, the second race, the third race, the fourth race, the fifth race sixth, seventh, and got to the eighth race, cold. Eight tops. Now the rest of the story, as he would say. Well, the previous day, I stunk up the joint. <laughs> so I only had one winner, and, uh, you know, I, that's a bad day. And I never know how I'm going to do. We don't, we, all, all of us don't know <laughs> how we're going to do. But after I won the first four, I started thinking this could be the perfect 300 bowling game. You started thinking, like, let it ride. You became a uh, trotter. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I felt infallible after the, <laughs> after the fifth and sixth winner. And my friend, my very close friend, Cousin Larry, yeah. were sitting at Wiz Village. And they got the low, low rollers <laughs> contest on Thursday. And... Cousin Larry's in for his five plays. He's won four through seven races. There you go. And all we care at that point, you know, I'm cashing obviously along the way. But right now we're saying, forget the money. We want the t shirt. Yeah. Right? Because they give you a free t shirt at the end of the contest. Well, I, I, I want to tell folks, I want to interrupt here and tell them when Michael hit the seventh race, I went on the internet and found. The golf match between Greg Norman and Fuzzy Zeller, where Norman was coming on strong and Fuzzy Zeller turned to him. He was playing in a hole again, took a white towel out and waved the white flag. I sent Michael the white flag. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it got to the ninth race. Yes. And the T-shirt was in, within scope of us, right? And that was my strongest play on the card. It was a Mike Maker horse, who I also right. know you liked. Yeah. And it was five to one. <laughs> now, I'm up $3,000, okay, going into that race. And I let the t-shirt <laughs> affect my emotions, right? Because Larry, all he wanted was the t He didn't care about the $1,000 because I was going to wear that t-shirt. He was not even going to wear it. He was going to hand it to me on the set to wear. That, I won that he won the high rollers contest. And I got to that race. And I said, I love this horse. I'm going to bet half my bankroll on this horse. And I don't like the exactness. I'm betting $1,500 to win at five to one. Now, I don't bet, to be honest with you, like a $500 to $700 bet's a good bet for me. But I'm like in a zone. <laughs> like, I, like nothing, nothing matters. Even emotions don't matter. I'm just going and pressing $1,500 win bet on this horse. Now, I was testing the gods of racing. <laughs> okay, and the god, when you start thinking you know something, the gods of racing will strike you down. But they, may, they strike you down in a very painful way. <laughs> it's like, I would have loved it if the horse was off the track. Yep. And I just say, I'm dead wrong. But what happens, he's in the back of the pack, He's still like six turning for home, but I see he's starting to come. All of a sudden, he splits horses. He knifes his way through horses, and it looks like this horse is going to win. He takes the lead, and I see my life in front of me. <laughs> I see like everything, like I'm going to die. I'm going to have a heart attack after the 10th race after I swept the board, but I swept the board, yeah. right? It's like a story from my fr uh, back in the day. Yeah. When my friend, it, where a guy bets the double, right? Uh, no, and, I know. <laughs> and, and he wins the first leg. In the second leg, he, he, there's a photo finish, and he drops down on the floor as if he's dead. And he's, like, laying there unconscious. And my friend Doc goes over to him, and, some, and he says, is the guy, people are saying, is he alive? Is he alive? And Doc's looking at the tickets, and he says, <laughs> only in the double. <laughs> so I felt like... I was w winning the race. He took the lead. Didn't he? he opened up like a half a length, yeah, a length. Yeah. And then before you know it, yep. 
he gets nailed on the wire. Pegasus from the back. <laughs> right. We lose the t-shirt. That's the first <laughs> thing that comes to my mind. I lose half my bankroll that I had won, and I realize, why the hell did I be, was I greedy? I overbet. The thing is, the lesson is, stay, no matter what, stay within your comfort level. Right. Don't be greedy, there's always another race. Right. But of course, I violated that. And then in the 10th race, I lose by a neck anyway. <laughs> so in two races, I lose by a neck for my perfect 300 game. And I've only swept the board once in my entire career, way back. Yeah. It's an impossible feat to do. Yeah, well, you, you got close. Eight out of ten is pretty darn good. And really what you're talking about is, is, is the emotion. And it's, it's an irony. It, you watch a PGA pro player, you can't, you can't tell if he made nine or if he made ace. You know, they, 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 they practice, they study being level and in the present and not letting too much affect their next play. And I think that's the lesson you're trying to share here. It's about being level. Yeah, and you know, every day I do a card, <laughs> I think I'm gonna have 10 cards. <laughs> and I work my way down yeah. quickly, okay? Uh, well, it's rare that, you know, you, you actually do it yeah. or come close to doing it. I'm gonna frame that in a different way. I had a dear friend, his name was Pony Campagna. He's passed, he was a professional player, but this was his, his wisdom. He said, horse players arrive at the track every day with a shovel. And they start mostly in the first race digging a hole. And then you spend the rest of the day with that shovel trying to dig your butt out. <laughs> right. I did the opposite. The hole was there. And then I just jumped, <laughs> jumped, in. I jumped into it after the ninth race. All right. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with the Wizards horse to watch. This is WizardsRacingSports.com's Get Tight On. Visit wizardracingsports.com and purchase now. Since 1986, the Wizard has been your source for the best handicapping products for the always challenging Saratoga meet. Wizard selections include analysis and wagering strategies for every race. Wagers are updated after late scratches. The Wizard wagers every day, backing up his opinions with his own money. Visit wizardracingsports.com and purchase now. Got the horse right here, her name is Paul Revere, and here's a guy that says if the weather's clear. Thank you for staying with us, ladies and gentlemen. We're still at the quarter pole. It's time for a horse to understand why you might want to bet back. Uh, was in Sunday's first race. It was a maiden race going a mile and a sixteenth on the turf. And this is Chad Brown wins first time out going long in a maiden special. And I'll, some of these horses come right back, you know, it's 30 days later or two months later, right into a stakes race and they win. I have one that I think is stakes quality next time out. The name of the horse is hard to justify. It's a son of justify. Mm -hmm. The horse was, it was a full field, broke from an inside post, went off as a lukewarm three to one favorite in a very competitive field mm -hmm. with a lot of well-bred horses. Hard to justify, broke in the air at the start. He quickly recovered and he was guided to the inside. Around the far turn, there was a horse outside of him that made a move and sort of crowded him and was looking to get to that hole along the rail. Hard to justify had to check hard off the heels of that horse, losing all momentum and position, and recovered, swung out wide in the stretch, and in the final eighth of a mile just barreled home with huge strides and galloped out very strong past the wire. For a first time starter, going a mile and a sixteenth in a full field to overcome trouble like that, that's a horse of quality. Watch this horse next time out and it will be in a stakes race. Yeah. No, no question. Uh, well, that's the end of uh, this segment of At the Quarter Pole. We're brought to you by wizardraceandsports.com. We'll be back with an interview and then our final commentary.
Welcome back to Down the Stretch, and my special guest today is Junior Alvarado. Welcome to the show, Junior. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. You know, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, when I was a kid, my father would take me to the racetrack. I wasn't at, even out of diapers. And we used to go to Aqueduct in Belmont and to Saratoga when it was four weeks. And when I was, this is before I was five years old, okay? Right. So when I was five years old for Christmas, I said to my father and mother, could you buy me a rocking horse? Because I used to watch the, I, I was a big fan, of, even at that age, of Brolio Baeza and Willie Shoemaker. Right. Wow. So I got the rocking horse, and I would get on the rocking horse, and I would make believe I was a jockey. I would go to the whip, I would shake the reins, right? And it didn't take too long that I fell off. I just fell off the rocking chair. And I said, enough of this. I ain't gonna be a jockey. Instead, I'm gonna be a handicapper and a gambler. There you go. And fast forward 60 years later, and I was a man of my word. I All became right. a professional handicapper, and I bet on the horses. Yeah, that's great. Now, when you were five years old, what were you doing? I was doing probably the same thing. I didn't have a rocket chair, but I, I, I used to put the couch together and kind of try to put like one of my dad all saddled there and you know, I would watch the races and pretend I was riding in one of those races. I would pick a horse and, and do pretty much the same thing when I was in Venezuela. So, how, when were you born? What year? I was born 1985. 1985. So, yes. was your dad into horses? Yeah, he was a jockey. He, you know, he was riding. That's probably where I got all this bug about to be a jockey. All the love that I have for the horses, you know, you just, you know, passed through me and and yes I mean I, I was a big fan I remember being probably four or five years old you know when I have start getting memories you know uh, all I wanted to be is a jockey I, all I wanted to be is like my dad and and I used to go to the races uh, in the afternoon with my mom and sometimes in the morning I would wake up and go with my older brother and my dad to the workouts in the morning it was just one of the best so time. in Venezuela yes okay so now you're going to school Right, I think. Yeah, Not like yeah, me, yeah, who I didn't went, go yeah, to school. Yeah, I, no, I, I went to and, school. And so you would go to the track, you'd go in the morning, and then at what stage of your young life did you say, I'm actually going to execute this plan that I want to be a jockey and I'm going to become a jockey? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, but I mean, I just, like I say, it was always since I was little, I wanted to be a jockey. Just, you know, I knew I needed to finish. Uh, middle school then you know when I was getting to high school I was like well I don't think I need to finish this to become a jockey but I'm glad my parents say like we ain't helping you if you don't finish high school we ain't not gonna help you you finish at least high school right and then we'll give you the support and we'll help you here and there so now what was your first job you uh, did you work in the barns first like walking hots or did yeah you yeah when I went to Venezuela you know I stay uh, what I was living in the city, where I was living, they didn't have any track, so I had to go probably like maybe like four hours away from where I was living, and and I had to stay in the barn. That's what I was living. I lived there in the barn for probably like a year, and and yeah, my first the first thing you do there, like I didn't never get on a horse before, so all I had to do first is you know do the bed for the horses, walk some horses, and you know once in a while I would get on a horse, and you know they would bring the horse from the stable all the way to the track and then the jockey will get on in the track. Right. So in that, you know, that little space right there between, I will get on the horse and they will walk the horse to the track and then when the jockey will jump off and bring the horse back to the barn, I will jump again in the horse and, and you know, and just little get them to fill the horses and stuff like that. But yeah, it, it was at least a, a good seven, eight months that I had a, before getting a horse that I had to help all, everybody in the barn. Now, did you watch American racing on TV? You know, I never watched American racing until probably when I was riding already in Venezuela, when I was a bug boy. That's when I started watching it. And like I said, I didn't have idea there was racing anywhere else in the world. <laughs> but my dad started kind of like putting that up there for me. He's like, listen, like, look at this. We have to go to an OTB, like uh, one of your days off and we can watch some, watch some races from New York and stuff like that. And So now you're an apprentice in Venezuela. 
And is it the same 10 pound bug, 10 pound weight that you get when you're an apprentice? Yes, yes, the same, the same, same thing. as here. We we'll right? do by kilos, it's like four kilos. Then when you want 20 races, you go to a three kilos. And when you want 40 races, you go to two kilos. And until you win 60 races, there is no like a year, like time after you win your federate here. There is only like, you have 60 races. So right off the bat as an apprentice, how did you do? Uh, you know, it, it was terrible the first year. <laughs> I probably, my first year with the license, that bad boy, I probably rode maybe 10 horse in a whole year. And that's when I decide, like, I think I might have to go try to a different track because, you know, they knew me already there. I yeah, working extremely hard. I would work probably daily, maybe 12 to 15 horses, galloping horses in the morning. And I was not getting any chance in the afternoon to ride any horses. So I was in Valencia at that time. And then I moved to Caracas and, you know, things changed very quick there. Probably was like maybe my first two, three months and I started getting mount and I started picking it up very quickly there. So, you know, if I knew you back then, if we were friends, I would have gotten you the mount on Canyonero the second. There you, you know go. why? Yeah, right I now. mean, I would have gotten you that mount. <laughs> and because Canyonero, right from Venezuela, right? Yes. yes. I was there wow. when they won, when he was running in the Belmont Stakes, going for the Triple Crown. Right. Remember the Derby? He came from way out oh, of it. Right. Yep. And then the neck preakness, he went to the front. Mm -hmm. And then for the Belmont, he had bad feet. Something happened. Yeah, that's But I have problem. never been to a Belmont Stakes, and I've gone to many, okay? I was there when Secretariat won the Triple Crown. I was there even before then. I have never seen so many Venezuelans and South American people. I saw more mariachi bands right. at Belmont Park on the third floor. It was, un and the Venezuelan flags. Yeah. Although it was unbelievable. It was the most joyous occasion that I've ever, American Pharaoh was good too, but Canyon Arrow the second, it's like half of South America we'll came that. in. And that was before your time. Yes, yeah, that was way you, before, yeah. So, so now, you, when did you start really building momentum and winning races? You know, it's, 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 everything started happening. You know, I, when I went to Caracas, like I said, I went like first week of January. I said, like, let me start the year here. And I will say probably around May, April, I was already, I was already winning races. You know, I was doing pretty good, you know, by November, I already had probably like maybe 50, 55 races won at that time. And, and I was already having somebody here in the United States. My brother was living in Miami. He was already kind of helping me out to get somebody to sign, sign a contract for me to come here. He gave me the idea too. And, and, and I said, well, I'm going to take a shot to come here to the United States. And, and you land in Florida. And I landed in Florida 2007, uh, February. Yep. Okay. And first, did you sign a contract with a trainer? It was, it was more like an owner, but they, they kind of like, it was just kind of just to, for me, so I could get the visa, the work visa. Okay. So, you know, once I get the work visa, I didn't even get to meet this gentleman who did the, who signed for me until probably like maybe eight years later. Right. Something like that. Yes. So, so now, so you rode at Gulfstream? Yes. Did you ride at Tampa? Uh, I stayed in Gulfstream and Calder when I got in 2007. It was just Gulfstream in the winter, and then it was Calder all, all kind of year round until the winter time. And you know, I did okay my first year there. You know, wasn't the greatest. Probably I was every other week. I, I keep looking flies to to go back to Venezuela. I was like, I don't. You're think homesick, this, right? Yeah, too. I was like, I don't think this is it for me. You know, I was winning in Venezuela here. I'm barely riding some horses here and right. there. I'm riding too many long shots. I. I, I <laughs> I was like, no, nah, I think I'm going back. Then, you know, I, I'm glad I had my brother with me because he kind of like helped me here. And, and so like, you have to wait, you have to give it a time. You have to give it a time, you have to keep working. Then, you know, 2008, I had an opportunity and I had an agent who called me to go to Chicago, Oscar Sanchez, and, and I made my move to, to Arlington. And I think that was probably my, the greatest move I ever made because since after that, you know, everything started building up very nice and quick. Now. About Arlington, I was really sad when they knocked it down. Yeah. I thought that was a great track. Dushi Swa, who I knew, who owned the track, and hired me to do something for him one, for the Arlington Million. I was there. That was the most family-friendly, beautiful track. 
in a great location. Remember the train Indeed. would stop right by Arlington Park? Wasn't it a special track? Yeah, it's, I always tell my wife, you know, we have our home in Long Island, but to me, for whatever reason, it just felt like home. Like Chicago to me, I don't know why, just like the people there, the, where I was living, the track, I felt like I was home. Right, for me, right. that, was, that was home and it's still feel until now. That is home, and yeah, I mean, we like I was extremely sad because I had my man set up and like, well, you know, when I'm about to get close to retire, we'll move to Chicago. I'll do some riding there in, in Arlington, and you know, maybe in the winter I take my time off, or maybe we go to Florida. You right, know, when right, I'm right. about to, you know, to start slowing down, and um, you know, they ruined that for me now. Right, I, I can do that now, so I had to change plan, and 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 yeah, I'm mean, extremely sad for. To me, it was. Top three, one of the best race yeah. track I've ever been. And you know, I actually claimed several horses and ran them in one races at Arlington and Hawthorne, which is another, right. like, Hawthorne to me is like Aqueduct and Belmont is like Arlington. Yes. My trainer, you might have ridden for him. I'm sure you've ridden for him, Dale Bennett. Dale Bennett, of course. <laughs> of course I did. A I, very good horseman yeah. and his father, yeah. Gerald yeah. Bennett. Dale Bennett, yep. Dale Bennett, very good horseman. Yes, he is. Yep, yep, and I know yep, you rode. Yep, yeah, you I pro- rode many for him, and I won many races for him. Right. Yeah. Yep. Hard worker, great family. Um, so now, how did he get to New York? Well, you know, I was doing great in in, in Chicago and Arlington. Then I try. I remember 2011. I went to to New York. I said, let me try the winter there, since I didn't want to do the winter in Hawthorne. So let me try the winter there. I did pretty good. I come back to Arlington. Then I used to ride a lot of horses for Eric Reed. He used to chip a lot of horses to Arlington. Then, you know, we became good friends. And I remember telling him, and like, Eric, like, you think you will know any good agent for me to either go to either Kentucky or to New York? So like, I would love to go to New York. That would be my goal. But, you know, like, if you can try to, to help me out to find somebody. Then he probably like, you know, that was the beginning of Arlington and by the end of Arlington, he said, I think I have you somebody here that can, they might, might help you. The guy's a very great agent and then he introduced me to, to Mike, Mike Salido. Right. And, you know, that was 2000, the end of 2011. And since then, you know, we've been working together until now. I knew Mike days, long, yeah. longer than that. We actually stayed in the same, same complex. My wife and the family stayed and I, he was always, a great guy to me we always had he just hit it off you yeah, know yeah. he's just such a wonderful human being um so you're in new york now and what year that was 2012 and you now you're stepping up in weight class a little bit right yes and how was the acclimation to new york how did the transition go you know i i went there by myself i at this point i i'm I had, my, I had my my firstborn and, you know, I told my wife, listen, you're probably going to have to stay in Chicago. You got your family here. I don't have nobody in New York, so let me just go by myself. Let me see what's going to happen. It's like I know my agent want me to stay in the winter, and then he asked me to stay. Like, that we have to push through it. It's going to get hard when everybody gets back from Florida, but if I want to try to make it in New York, I have to, I have to stay. So I don't know how that will go. Just let me go by myself first and, and see what's going to happen. And, you know, if everything goes well, you know, I'll bring you guys here. If you know, I'll probably come back to right. Arlington. And, you know, I mean, Mike is having very good connection with great people. You know, I had a great feeling right away. And then, you know, like I stayed there and, and then, you know, like after Aqueduct, we were winning races. And then you come the spring and the summer. We got to come here for the first time to Saratoga, and 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 I told my wife, listen, I I, I fall I fall in love with going to Saratoga, you know, and we have to do this together as a family, and and that's when you know I start looking, you know, brought my family to New York, and and little by little. Who was the first trainer that really gave you your first break? Was there a train, or was it just he was booking on a lot of different trainers? Yeah, he was booking on a lot of different trainers. I knew he got he was very good with Mr. Mott, but uh, you know, I I was coming from Arlington, you know, I was, you know, I, I would say a person who was becoming somebody, you know, I was hoping he would give me opportunities, but he had a, a many other writers in front of me, and you know, I had to understand that I just had to work my work to get to the barn, but. Um, 
Yeah, there were many trainers that helped me at the beginning. There were many trainers. I can't really point out one because there were many trainers who, who did you now, know, help me out. I had my eyeball on you as a jockey that I really liked right from the start. Because I go back in New York racing to the 60s. Wow. Now, to prove that I'm not bullshitting you, that I really liked you, I had a horse right here. I printed out the PPs. Flamingo Lane. Flamingo Lane. And I had 50% ownership <laughs> of this horse. And here is 2014. Yeah. Right? Who's the guy that I said I wanted yeah. on this horse? Who was it? There you go. Who was yeah. it? Yeah. You. Yeah. Right there. Right there. Yeah. You rode it one, two, three, four, five times. Yeah. You remember the horse? Yeah, yeah of course I do. Okay. Yeah. It was a, a win, yep. one, two wins, a second, second by a head and a second by a neck and a third by, by a head. Yeah. Two races at Saratoga, right, with a win and a second, yeah, okay? Yeah. I wanted you on my horse. Yes, now and, I remember. Yeah, I that, remember my agent telling me. Tactical yeah. speed. Yeah. Always. Now, when I think of Junior Alvarado in my head, if somebody said to me, what's the first thing that comes into your mind when you think of Junior Alvarado? I say underrated, could ride with the best of them. I would take you in any situation, any time. Horses that close, sit in mid-pack, speed horses. There's, and I said, there's no better rider that I would want on my horse if there's a sixteenth of a mile to go right. and I'm battling tooth and nail. Who do I want on my horse to get that extra oomph out of the horse? Right. That would be Junior Alvarado. Okay. <laughs> Now, question, do you ha handicap the races? Of course, I would think you do. Yes, I, I do. I'll handicap and then I'll watch the replays. I will watch a replay of my horse. Then if I think I have my horse is probably the third chance, fourth chance in the race, then I will look up the horse that I think have the first, second and third chance just to see what are the weakness, how I can beat them. Mm -hmm. you know, I, that's how I always look at it that way, you know, I have to have somewhere in the race where I can see them and I can maybe either move before them or I can keep them in there. Well, trying to figure it out because it's, it's not, it's, it's, you know, it's not just getting on the horse and going for a ride. I have a question. So I can't even like begin to think what it would be like, what it's like to be a rider, a hundred and ten pound jockey aboard an eleven hundred pound animal now when you when you're riding i have a few questions that i've always thought of because i fell off my rocking horse right. so i have no clue <laughs> so when you're riding are you caring about the horse in front of you setting the pace as much as the horses that are sitting second and third and waiting to see when they're making their move or like how do you judge like, what do you, so you're on the horse, what are you looking at, you know, you, the start of the race, you gotta get break sharply. Right. A bad break a, compromises your horse, so you're yeah. getting your horse ready, right in the gate. But when you're actually riding, and you, you, you hit the back stretch, and you're heading into the far turn, are you, what's your mindset? Well, tell me what you're thinking. I mean, instinctually, what are you feeling? Well, first thing, I'm just trying to feel what I have under me. Knowing what I have under me will determine what am I gonna start looking for, what horse are I gonna look for, or what part of the race I'm gonna start to picking it up. It just, everything will just depend on what I feel. You know, if I feel, if I feel that I got the right horse, I feel it's moving beautifully, I think, I got plenty horse under me. 
I don't really get to worry about other horses. How do you know you have plenty under you and you have something that's not has nothing under you? Like, what is the feeling like? It's, it's a feel you get. You, you learn. You know, I've been reading. You know, many races. It's, it's, I, I mean, I can't even really explain. It's a feel. It's, it's a feeling. It's, it's some instinct that you learn. You get. You know, when you ride so many horses, so many good horses, so many slow ones. Like you get to. To know when when you have a horse underneath you are you looking like the pace of the race the fractions do you have a sense of how fast the race is going like you know on turf races they tend to go slow and sprint home right you don't okay. see you know five and a half furlongs you could see fast paces because right. you got to run fast from start to finish but like in mile and eighth races or mile races how do you do you have a sense of the pace? Do you feel how fast it's going? Yeah, normally I try to, like I said, ride my horse, break out of there and put it into a rhythm, put it into a pace. You know, I want my horse probably go like in 49. So that's what I worry first. I don't worry about what else everyone else is doing at the moment. I just want to make sure my horse get, gets into a rhythm where I know I'm going to have a horse to finish. Then, you know, if I'm sometimes, you know, you get, if it's turf racing, sometimes you're going maybe a little slower because everybody's slowed down in front of you. You got horses on the outside, you cannot move. Then, you know, I start like looking horses. I'm trying to see who horse is moving the best. If I have to follow somebody to, you know, make my way through it. And, and, and that's, that's what I do. You know, I know what horses are the favorite, but sometimes doesn't mean much when you see another horse probably moving better in the race, you know. Do you watch riders? Yes. You yes. watch the riders? Yeah, many riders have, you know, their style. Everybody has a different style. And some riders, like, you know, they will make some kind of move in part of some races. And, you know, I kind of know, I was like, okay, I'm going to follow him. He might want to start picking it up here because you always like to move around this point And, you know. Is the race from start to finish quiet? Like, to jockeys say nothing? Or do you hear sometimes jockeys say, I'm coming through? I'm coming through, you know, there's a hole, uh, you know, or like, do they get out of my way? Like, like, or whatever. Do you no, no, it's actually quiet. It's very quiet. The only time you might hear something if it's really getting too tight in a spot, if somebody's going into a bad spot. And normally if you put yourself in that spot, nobody will it's say gonna... anything because you're following, you're putting yourself into a bad spot. You know, but if it's sometimes a horse trying to run off and going into a bad spot and you're trying to get out of there, but your horse is not helping you, sometimes you give us heads up. It's like, I'm rank, you know, I'm going right there, I'm rank. I have, you know, I got no control, you know, and other rider will look and probably give you a break so, so you can, you know. I would imagine yourself. riders respect one another. Yes, that There's a great respect yeah. for yeah. each other. So about a race, we're gonna talk a couple races. One is, the curling that you won, yeah, you can look at this. A one it was Blazing Sevens was a big favorite, big favorite yep. and you were on Scotland, an improving lightly raced horse for Bill Mott. So, I look at this horse and I see versatility. You won from way back, you won stalking, and you won again from way back with just a push button horse. Not a lot of speed in the race with a small field. Blazing Sevens is the big favorite. So I'm thinking, when I looked at this race, I picked Scotland. And you know why I picked Scotland? Because I'm going to say, when I looked at it, Junior is going to the front. He ain't giving a damn. He's put, the only horse that's going to go and bother you is Il Maricalo. And you're going to go out and you're going to look at El Maricalo and you're going to say, screw you, I'm going right. to the front. You are not going to beat me. And you actually run one, two, right? Didn't El yes, Maricalo? Yes, right. Yes, yes. Am I right? Is that like you were going to the front? You weren't going to, if he broke, if right, he broke exactly, sharp, yes. he had to break sharp. But if he did, you were going to put that horse, right? Yeah, that was kind of like the plan. You know, I knew he was quick. And coming from those seven furlong where they've been going 45, 45, 45, I, you know, it was in my mind that I knew it's like, if he breaks good enough, he will probably just take me right away because he's, he, he's sharp. I knew he's sharp. I thought I had the best horse to, to do that, to be able to get out of there and put myself in the lead because I, you know, I thought I was riding the best horse. And I mean, it just, it happened 
that way, you know, he broke out of there, he broke like the best horse, he broke sharp out of there, and you know, he, he pretty much took it to them. So, he's gonna go to the Travers, I would presume. I would think that if he came out of the race good, that would be a likely spot, right. yes? Exactly, yes. So, in my opinion, you know, Mage, Venezuela. Right? Yes, yes. You know, there's some good three-year-olds, but not great. They're not great. This is the time the horses, the three-year-olds that have developing, they start getting mature and peaking. Yes. And I'm looking at a horse like Scotland, and I'm saying to myself, yes, he has to improve. Like, he has to move forward Keep again. This, forward. Is, this is a, a, a whole nother ball game, going a mile and a quarter. But he's got the race over the track. He's improving. He's versatile, right? Yes. Which makes him dangerous. Do you agree? Yeah, hundred percent. It's a horse who, like, anyone would love to ride that kind of horse. Where, like, if it's no pace, you can be in the lead. If either go medium pace, you can stop. If either go too fast, you can come from behind. You can go inside. You can go tight between horses. I mean, it's just a like a dream kind of horse that you wanted you, to, to you, be on. You know what he reminds me of, like Arch Angelo. Yes. Lightly raced, got good for the Belmont, mm -hmm. training great for the Travers, beautifully trained by Jen Antonucci. Yes. But again, similar, similar. Yep. You know, he was spotting seasoning in the Belmont, going a mile and a half, but he got, he ran, got a great ride by Javier, Beautiful. who I talked about, yeah. gave Hall of Fame rides abroad mage in, in the Derby, which you, anyone yeah. who knows anything about horse racing, Javier, won those two races. Yes, 100% agree. Brilliant yeah, rides. Yeah. So it's a similar horse to Mage, getting good at the right time for the right race with a race over the track. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, I, mean, I, I wouldn't trade position at this time. No, you know? no, no way. I, I love what I have under me. Now, you know, racing is in a tough situation now, you know, with a lot of, uh, drugs that have been in the game and the bet betting, the, the odds change. There's a lot of issues. Yes. And I see it's turning around. Hissa is, you know, they've got to improve things, but we want a clean game. We want clean trainers, clean horses. We want to change. These breakdowns are too many. It's, you know, the breed is not sturdy like it used to be when yeah. I was growing up. So, it's in a tough situation, but getting better. But you, Cody's wish, put to see the smile yeah. that you just got on your face. <laughs> Cody's wish is becoming like what Seabiscuit was in the Depression. He, when the Depression happened in America, people are broke. Seabiscuit gave everybody something to root for. I look at Cody's wish as becoming that type of horse. Now, you are the rider of Cody's wish, so you play that enormous role in this horse. And the story is unbelievable. You know, Cody Dorman, 17 years old, uh, terrible genetic disorder, in a wheelchair. So Godolphin, and make a wish foundation get together and Cody is brought to the farm in Versailles, Kentucky in his wheelchair and Cody's just a foal and Cody's wish puts his head on Cody Dorman's legs mm -hmm. and the relationship begins and opens it up for other children with disabilities and connections with horses. So now, Cody, you, you ride, you ride, you start riding Cody's Wish, and I have the PPs here of the career of this horse. And, you know, you ride the horse in the debut, but then you start riding the horse consistently in the Westchester last year, and you haven't stopped. So, What's your connection, your personal? You have three kids, yes. and I'm sure you've sat down with your yeah. kids and yeah. talked about the story. Yeah. Tell me the story from your 
angle. From you know, you've just been incredible. I mean, I, at the beginning, you know, you kind of like, is this real? You know, you just maybe something that is casual happening, maybe. You know, I don't want to say like, oh, yes, it was, you know, I, I had to kind of see it with my own eyes. I had to see it more than once to kind of like, wow, it is real. You know, I, I couldn't just go and say, yes, it is. You know, I had to make sure myself first that like w what's happening, what I'm seeing it was 100 percent true. And and like I say, when I, I think everything kind of like clicks 100 percent for me when when we won the British Cup. The or, dirt mile. Yeah, the dirt mile. Won the, that race, everything. At that, at that moment, I was a believer, but I guess I needed to cross the wire first. For, and then what happened right after, how the horse just keep going to get the picture taken. And after he gets the picture, he goes right straight to him, kind of like greeting him. I mean, Cody. Yes. He, he just, I mean, that's he, he, it, he that, that's blows on, my mind. You, yeah. They had a segment on during Derby, the NBC telecast, and you know you could be a little jaded in this game. You know, exactly. you know, you just. Yes. Uh, I watched that story, and I actually was like mesmerized. I actually cried, like, and it, you know, and I cry pretty easily. But that really sent me to my knees, and everybody else who's watching, and. When you won the Breeders' Cup, and you're bringing the horse, so when did the horse put its head down on Cody? Like you were on the horse still? No, I had a, you know, just I just taking everything off, getting the tack off. The thing with him is like he has two ways that I've been since I've been riding him. He does. He did it the the this race right here in in Kentucky. Right. I won this race. A small stake. Yeah, we went into the winner's circle and he's there. Then they tried to stop him for the picture and he keep walking forward toward him. Toward Cody. Toward Cody. And then they tried to fix it with the picture. We turn around again, trying to fix it. He keeps going toward him. A third time, we tried to get him for the picture. He wouldn't settle until... What are you he, saying to yourself? Like you're saying, this I is crazy. Like, I'm like, like I said, I want to believe it. But I'm like, no, maybe, maybe something else, maybe something else. Then it's like, I, then I told the groom, I think he wants to just let him go a little closer to Cody. Maybe he, he wants to be closer. Exactly, he went there, put his head right there, stay there for probably like a good, maybe 10 seconds, walked around and he paused for the picture. I, I, right that race, I was like, I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't like, I, I couldn't even explain it. Explain to me, you have three kids. How old are they? They're 12, 8, and 4. Okay. What's the what do you tell them about a lesson to be learned by the lesson you've been taught with Cody's with? Yeah, no, you know, he's, we'll, you know, we've been teaching them a lot about this. One of the main things that actually will, will, I've been taught my kids is just like, you know, we do have everything. We probably, we sometimes, we want this, we want that, we want that. We, we have everything we need. We want more stuff, yes, but we should be happy with what we have. And we got to enjoy life as much as we can because it, it's, it's, it's like looking at him and talking, like, look at this kid. Like, how hard his life would be for him. Like, kid can not be easy. And sometimes we complain because of this, we complain because of that. It's like, we have easy life. We have everything. Like, we should just be more grateful and enjoy. Has that changed you as a person? Yes, for sure. Yes, yes. Make, make you look some things differently. For when sure. things get tough, or you get angry, you get pissed. You go back to like, what am I doing? Yep. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, look at, you just go back to that. You, the, back, you yep. keep going back. It's like a recurring tape. Yep, 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 I go back and like I said, for me it's like a reset button. Once I start thinking again, like it calms me down and I start from zero so, again and do it again. So now you go into the Met Mile last time out and you're sitting at the back of the pack, okay? And I'm listening, Tom Durkin was back calling the race and I'm watching and he says, I don't know the word he used, but it was almost like you were toiling. Yeah. Toiling, toiling was the yeah, word. Toil. Yes. <laughs> and I was saying, I don't know who I was saying this to, maybe to, to my wife. I said, 
he ain't toiling. He's just waiting, <laughs> like just waiting. He's got a ton of horse. He just wants to time his move. And when it's time to ask, he's going to go. True? Yes. 100%, there was, he wasn't yeah. toiling, right? No, no, never, never had any, you know, I never felt so confident riding a horse. And like, you know, each race, he even teach me, like, just to trust me, like, help me out and let me know when it's time to go and I'll go. You see, the relationship that he has with Cody is the relationship that he's building with he's you. He's building it, yes. And exactly. that's why come Saturday in the Whitney, it's a different situation. Now he's going to be asked to go a mile and an eighth around two turns. And I don't think he's gone. He's gone a mile and a sixteenth, right? Yes. Uh, but it's, I mean, he's a great miler, a, spe a one turn miler. Going a mile and an eighth is a little bit different ball game. You, there's always that question, can he get that eighth of a mile? Exactly. Yeah. So you're going to be, the world is going to be watching Cody's way. Now, Cody Dorman is undefeated being at a race that Cody's Wish runs at. I think he's a perfect four for four. Yes. Is he coming to the Whitney? Yes, he is. I hear his comments, so. Five for five, yes. okay? Because <laughs> he got to go to the winner's circle and put his head on, right? Exactly. Uh, on his lap. So, mile and eighth. I presume it's gonna be the same thing. Like, not to take, I, if I was a rider, like thinking about how I would ride this horse, I would just let him be where he is, like get him nice and relaxed. If it's towards the back, you know, I don't want to get too far back, but I'm going to get him, I'm going to care more about getting him settled to a nice stride. And then on the turn, quarter pole, maybe a little bit later approaching, turning for home, you do what you do, right? Yes, I mean, that's, that's, that's do, the idea. Do you chirp on him? Do you shake the, like when you're sitting on him and it's ready to go, what, do you actually, do you do anything other than? With him, he's like the real push button. I don't have to smooch, I don't have to do anything. I just move my hands a little bit and he's, in, he's on, he's on. That, that's all I do with him. I just move my hands a little bit and I don't have to tap him on the shoulder at the time that I wanted to, to start to picking it up. I so just move my hand a little bit and he knows, he knows. Oh, that's great. Well. I, I'm going to wish, I mean, the, the whole, all of America is going to wish for a victory. And, and he's such a great horse. And who is the main contender in the race? You know, this guy there, I'm guessing, you know, that one, the, there's a horse that just won for Brad Cox. I um, can't remember his name. Just won in Kentucky, won a big race. And, you know, I know Kenny McPig has other two horses, Mile Happy and another old horse. But, you know, I haven't seen what's really going for sure a hundred percent into that race but once again uh, you're not worried I, I, about I, I, who cares I, yes, about the I, I, others exactly. you know you're riding I, I, your I, horse i'm riding my horse i'm a hundred percent confident in my horse and yeah. and and i mean i just think if i would have tried going mile and an eight with him this is the time yeah exactly yes. well i hope you enjoyed the interview yes and I did. thank you for for coming on i really appreciate yes, it no, thanks for having me and you know it was a great time yeah, you know, thank, you so thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. And we'll be back for the gallop out. Uh, this is Wizard for WizardRaceAndSports.com. See you soon. Visit WizardRaceAndSports.com and purchase now. Since 1986, the Wizard has been your source for the best handicapping products for the always challenging Saratoga meet. Wizard selections include analysis and wagering strategies for every race. Wagers are updated after late scratches. The Wizard wagers every day, backing up his opinions with his own money. Visit wizardracingsports.com and purchase now. Well, it's time for the gallop out through the wire. Michael, we've got three items to talk about. Uh, first of all, steward decisions. Stewards, uh, when the stewards uh, 
discuss, adjudicate, and decide. Let's talk about that. Well, when there is a decision process, we see on the screen now the four shots. So we see a head-on, we see from the back, we see a pan shot. Uh, but what I would love to see or hear, actually, ultimately, I'd love to hear the discussion of right. the stewards, but we ain't hearing the discussion. <laughs> but I feel that we should get some sort of transcript of the conversation of what, how they made their decision. It's educational, first of all. And I'd like, it's, it's just... It's transparency. It, that's what it is. It's transparency. No? So uh, we'll see. I, I think the only way you get that is to kind of lobbying for it. We're asking our audience to consider it. Maybe we'll send a few uh, emails to the Racing and Gaming Commission here in New York and see what, the, what their process the, could the, be. The most important thing is consistency in decisions. Mm -hmm. And there's just continues to be too much inconsistency across the board with these steward decisions. Yeah. I always profess to say, put a professional handicapper <laughs> as one of the guys right. where he can rest his computer and bet during the day, but he could be part of the decision process. That's right. I think Nick Kling wanted that too as well. Really? Our buddy Nick, okay. yes, absolutely. Okay, this is an interesting topic. Um, the whole notion of voided claims. You know, you're talking about 24 people shaking for a horse, they get the horse, and then there are legitimate reasons, but then the guy found that, oops, the claim has been voided. And you could find that out like two, three days later. And then it comes up, it shows up in the PPs as horse was claimed, but the claim was voided. The horse is running, uh, you know, in, in maybe up in class for the same trainer and jocks. <laughs> you, you know, right. And that's <laughs> what's crazy is that, you know, in actuality, if you see a V, yeah. a voided claim, and you're thinking it's a was a vet void, which is which is certainly um, one of the real reasons for voiding a claim, which prevent, protects everyone. Right. It's like if I was in a race and I pulled a hamstring, right. and I come back a month later, you know, is that hamstring healed? Like That's what? A what or what was the injury? Right. right. So it's just a V, and I have a tendency that I don't want a horse that has a V on it, okay? Because I'm thinking, because I know that when I've made a claim in Kentucky and there's like, the vet comes after the race in the receiving barn, you have to jog the horse, and if he's lame or there's something off, the, void, the claim is voided. So I'm looking at, I'm shying away from that horse that has the V, but what about a horse where it was voided because you spelled the wrong that, name out yeah, this on is the claiming slip. Th this is important. Okay, I know that as a fact because my friend did that, spelled like the wrong spelling of the name by a letter. They void the claim. If you don't pay, what's the insurance? The, 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 it's the aftercare. Aftercare insurance, 1.5%, yeah. right, I right. think. Um, it's going to be voided. So here's my question then. How do we know, A, uh, that whether or not it was a legitimate physical reason for which the, the, the claim was voided, or whether it was a clerical error or a clerical error. Yeah, I, <laughs> you know? I, I think <laughs> there should be something in the, that's another transparency issue where we should know because you, I'm not, I'm not going to discount a horse if I know the, the guy wrote out the wrong yeah. claim slip, okay? Yeah. But you see the V and you think there's some uh, issues wrong. But V, scratch the horse out, right? Right. Okay. Uh, Hissa. Well, you know, they, I really we started, like... We started the, the series talking about Hissa, the new sheriff in town. Yes. Right. And, you know, I have had uh, the pleasure of talking to trainers this meet and the first question I ask is how they are dealing with this and what they think and they all like the idea and the concept of it you know you got to clean the game up and put some fear in these trainers but to me it's almost unconstitutional to go and say okay we suspect you so there's a findings we're going to escort you off the track like Ray Handel yeah Ray Handel lost two owners because of this, okay? They escorted him off the track. It was July 4th weekend. Clark Brewster, his attorney, who he has to pay for, yeah. is, well, we gotta wait till Wednesday, right? And he 
is found not guilty for what they escorted him. It's first of all, it's embarrassing. It's unfair. Right. And the other thing is, I was talking to Baffert, and he was telling me in California when there's a split sample, it's returned in like three or four days the results. Here in New York and in other places, it could take two months, and and so there's got to be some consistency. But yes, you could suspect somebody, but until you find that he's guilty, I think it's unconstitutional to do what they did to a guy like Handel. Well, I, I think of the witch trials. You know, they a, a person was mentioned or accused, they dragged him to the stake, and in this case, Ray Handel was dragged out placed on the stake, the guy was coming with the torch, but he wasn't guilty and they let him loose. Yeah, and it's crazy, they're, te they're testing for, you know, one thousandths of picograms, wow. and it's, it's very hard to circumvent, you know, being caught for something. They, ha they are doing a good job, they just got to get better at it, and they will. Okay, so uh, at the top of the show I suggested that uh, we were going to do a uh, sort of CBS 60 Minutes uh, review of a couple of topics. Well, um, to open the series, no, we were talking about, uh, or last week we talked about the new Saratoga as opposed to the old Saratoga. Well, I was fortunate uh, this weekend, I got to spend a little time uh, at the premier uh, hospitality site uh, at the, the stretch at Saratoga. It's very comfortable, they've done a great job there. But on my, on my way out, uh, just Behind the segment, there's a railing where uh, patrons can stand, and they're probably six feet from the most expensive seats in the house. And I came across these six guys, six, seven guys, young guys, and they were set for the day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there they are with their Naira Bet cards, and each one had their own 12 pack of. <laughs> totally different beers. It was a smorgasbord. It looked like a craft beer uh, extravaganza. And they were having a great time and loving the races. And if the game is in their hands, I'm happy. Yeah. And here's a picture of it. Yeah. And I, I just have to say, it's a, it's a Saratoga I like. I happen to enjoy the energy and the youth. Uh, I sit at Wiz Village in the backyard behind the pizza yeah. grill with a couple picnic tables. And I, there's kids, people of all ages, just having fun. And I like that. That's great. Now, Wiz took a video, and he took a video of the cleanest racetrack floor you'll have ever seen. <laughs> now, it was after the seventh race on Saturday, <laughs> the busiest day with 35,000 people there. And I, right after the race, I waited until the race was official. And I don't remember, after a race is official, people looked at their tickets and then just threw them on the ground in disgust. I went along, stooping down, looking for somebody that threw a winning ticket out, me and the other stoopers. Yeah. Here's a video of after a race is official. <laughs> And I could have gone the length of a football field, and there wasn't one ticket on the ground. I mean, I literally, I mean, I want to start buying tickets and littering the ground so that I can just say, hey, this, this, is, what I, it, this, this is what it was like. Yeah. Well, the, you know, it, it's testimony to the fact that we live in a, an iPhone world and a swipe card world, and uh, Naira Betts has signed up a lot of folks for the machines. And the last thing we're going to talk about, you know, we were, we were very intent in our segment on chowder and Wiz followed up. Well, you know, I'm a Harry M. Stevens, the yesteryear, you know, as we talked about when I got a clam chowder, there's always clams in it, <laughs> multiple clams. So I saw the chowder man on Saturday and I said, chowder man, how's the chowder this year? I'm coming back to the bar. He said, it's much improved. <laughs> so he said, let me give you a cup on the house. He gives me a cup, goes to his big kettle, yeah. like a 20 gallon kettle. He takes his ladle, just dips it in, puts it in the cup, seals the cup. I bring it to the table. I don't eat anything until it's in the on the table with people witnessing my <laughs> first spoon. I open up the chowder and here's a video of me mixing the chowder and searching for the clams. 
And you found some? I actually, so as I mentioned, I bought 36 chowders during the meet. And I counted about six, seven clams <laughs> over the, it was more potatoes. And I actually told Chowder Man, this was potato soup. You can't call it clam chowder, it's potato soup. This time, I took my spoon, rotated the chowder, and I actually found three clams. There you go. Now, on you know, one day, That's three. Good. And actually, they were real clams. That's good. And there were less potatoes. And I went back to Chowder Man on Sunday and I said, thank you. It wasn't proved as you said. There are clams in the chowder. <laughs> well, uh, that's the end of this week's show, uh, sponsored by WizardRacingSports.com. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week. Visit WizardRacingSports.com and purchase now. Since 1986, The Wizard has been your source for the best handicapping products for the always challenging Saratoga meet. Wizard selections include analysis and wagering strategies for every race. Wagers are updated after late scratches. The Wizard wagers every day, backing up his opinions with his own money. Visit WizardRacingSports.com and purchase now.